I start, I'd like to just make a few uh, comments reflecting on uh, this morning. Um, I'm going to start by obviously thanking the Secretariat, Lemma, um, uh, and, his, and his team for inviting me. It's, it's really a pleasure to be back in the AERC family for this event. Um, the second thing I want to mention is just uh, by way of protocol, you can see that it says IGC on the top of my, my first slide. Um, what I'm going to talk about are some issues that I have been working on under the, um, the aegis of the, of the IGC, but for the East African community. But anything that I say uh, today is very much in my own personal capacity. So I want to start with a sort of question, why, why talk about deeper integration? Um, if I were to take a, a straw poll now on the basis of, of this morning's discussion and a little bit this afternoon, uh, and said, asked a question, something to the effect of, well, should we be going further on the regional integration agenda? I suspect I'd get results or responses that say, no, we need to consolidate where we are at the moment, or no, as someone said, I think it was Chido Say said earlier, we've probably been too ambitious on this agenda. And then the third would be, no, because you need to be careful what you wish for. Uh, a lot of people in this room share a lot of anxieties about furthering regional integration, going from customs union to economic and, and monetary union. But I think we must engage with this issue, um, and we must engage with it for uh, a number of reasons. At the opening session this morning, we heard the Prime Minister and indeed the Executive Director say, essentially the future is regional integration. And that, I think to quote Lemma, we want to think about integration across all markets, goods, services, factor markets, capital. And it's not just that that's part of the intellectual agenda, it's very much part of the policy agenda. We could go back to um, the uh, African Union's own um, Abuja Treaty uh, and its um, endorsement, as the Prime Minister mentioned, of, of full economic uh, integration back in the 1990s. We can look across the regions. We get similar sentiments from ECOWAS. If you were to look up the, uh, the web pages of SADAC, you'd see exactly the same ambition of moving to ever closer union, ever deeper economic integration. And right here in the East African community, we see it in a very precise sense. It was about three and a half, four years ago, in, certainly in this town, I'm not sure if it, were, if it was in this hotel, that the heads of state of the East African community signed the protocol for monetary union that anticipates anticipated economic and monetary union in uh, the next decade, essentially. So it's very much on the, on the policy agenda. And so in some sense, we've got an obligation to discuss the issues and indeed to rethink uh, the issues. And that's really what I want to talk about uh, in my 30 minutes or so today. But before I get to that, I wanted to pick up on one other point that was raised um, in the discussion this morning, and that was um, uh, from, from Franny and her nice uh, reference uh, to the movie, to the Black Panther movie, where she uh, made the point of the importance of the interaction of external threats and coordinated responses. And in a sense, that is absolutely the central issue about regional integration. It's absolutely fundamental. Whether we're talking about external threats or indeed existential threats, that issue about how the role of the external threat and the ability to respond to external threats defines the debates on regional integration. The, the father of, of European, uh, European integration, Jean Monnet, has this nice phrase where he said, l'Europe se fera en crise. Europe makes itself or progresses through crisis. And that's a, a, a reflection of, of not just the early days of European integration where essentially the European project was about working out to how to hold your enemies so close that war was inconceivable and using economic integration as a means of holding your enemy, your historical enemy close was the start of the European integration project, the European coal and steel community which bound France and Germany into a close economic partnership uh, in, in the very early 1950s. So it's about solidarity and it's about the use of that external threat to create uh, community. But I think we need to flip it the other way around as well and think about to what extent does our 
architecture and our institutions shape the way in which regions and countries and their people respond to threats, respond to external economic threats or other, other forms of crises. And I think when we do that, uh, Adam Mugume said one of the big uh, sort of elements to finding um, stupidity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different answer. But I think we're actually, we may be doing the same thing over again, but it's got to be based on thinking beyond the simple economics that often dominates our, our, our thinking about these issues to lift the, the lid and think about the underlying political dynamics that are driving certain decisions. Why did certain outcomes succeed? Why did others fail? Not simply in terms of the application of particular economic uh, policies. It's about what the underlying political dynamic uh, is delivering. Them. So that's kind of the, the issues that I want to focus on. And as I say, I will, I will move reasonably briefly through my comments and leave it open for, for discussion. So I'm going to look at three things. First, I'm going to emphasize this notion of centrifugal forces, forces leading to, to di econo economic divergence and why fiscal institutions play an important role in dealing with those. I want to then talk about upping the stakes that as you move from a, from a customs union arrangement to a, to a monetary or economic, deeper economic uh, integration model, how the, the pressures are increased and therefore the demands on fiscal in infrastructure are increased. And finally, I want to talk a little bit about uh, institutional responses and the Im really important issue of resource costs, the cost of putting in place this fiscal architecture. So let's start with the, the, the first and, and rather basic point. If you think of, of a journey towards deep integration, you can think of it moving from a sort of free trade area through customs union to a common a single market for labor, capital, possibly for land, so that land ownership um, is not directly tied to nationality, through to economic and monetary union where you consider a single or common monetary policy and exchange rate regime, and through to the final step of full political union where in a sense trade, fiscal, and macro issues from an economic perspective are internalized within a single political feder federation or political union. Now, here I think is the, the challenge. When we think of this, this movement, and I think this underpins a lot of the, the comments that we had earlier this morning, there is a sense that deep integration generates the potential for increased growth, productivity, and prosperity. That's, that's the kind of fundamental economic rationale for regional integration. The problem is that with regional integration comes pressures for divergence, fundamental pressures for economic divergence. We can think of these as centrifugal processes. These pressures may make it harder, progressively harder, for this growth, the growth potential that deeper regional integration produces, for that to be genuinely inclusive, for that growth to be inclusive both at the country level and within countries. That regional integration creates centrifugal forces that risk undermining the aggregate growth effects with damaging distributional effects. What does that mean? Well, fundamentally, that means that successful progression along this regional integration route demands heavy and increasing investment at both the national and the supranational level in institutional structures of governance. And at the heart of these institutional structures are the fiscal and quasi-fiscal institutions. And once you talk about investment in quasi and fiscal and quasi-fiscal institutions at the regional level, you're talking about sovereignty. And you're talking about the question of how far are the participants in a regional grouping prepared to pool and share sovereignty? How far is that dilution process prepared to go? And that, I think, is the fundamental issue that we're dealing with when we talk about regional integration. I also think that it's an issue that starts, it's not an issue exclusively for economic and monetary union. It's not a monetary union problem. It's a, it's a deeper 
uh, and more and an earlier issue. It's an issue that that rotates around the customs union and it rotates around single markets as much as it does around monetary union. I speak as a as a committed European who happens to be living in a country that has taken a distinctly non-European path, uh, or at least direction of travel at the moment. And that's not about European monetary union. As, as you know, the United Kingdom never entered the European monetary union. It's, a, it's an issue about these questions of sovereignty at the level of the customs union and the single market. So these, these deep fiscal issues, I think, emerge at a very early stage in thinking about regional integration. Okay, so let's see if I can make some progress here. Okay. So, very briefly in, in 30 seconds, what are the promises of ever closer union? This question came up earlier. Why do we want to, to look at integration? Um, the gains from integration come from the expansion of markets, quite simply. The expansion of markets, the destruction of monopoly that dominates small markets, the ability to exploit the economies of scale, both in terms of production and in terms of the scale and location of infrastructure, if we link it back to, to the, earlier, uh, uh, the earlier discussion this afternoon. So it's, it's about the welfare gains from scale in economic activity, the feedback from that scale onto productivity, and the ability to combine public and private, domestic and foreign capital more efficiently on a larger scale. In a sense, these are these are the simple aggregate gains from, from regional integration. As I said before, an awful lot of the, the logic and the, the drivers behind um, regional integration initiatives are not about the economics, they're about the politics. They're about um, the security agenda. I mentioned the European coal and steel community, but in the European context, you can think of two other really major events in terms of creating and supporting a security agenda. By creating linkages between countries that reduce the risk of conflict and improve the kind of agency of restraint that institutions provide over domestic policy making. In Europe, the big events would have been bringing the previous dictatorships of Spain and Portugal into the, the embrace of the European Union. They're about bringing the accession countries of Eastern Europe into the embrace of the European Union. They're about the discussion between Europe and Turkey about bringing Turkey within or not, within the European Union, as, as the politics of the, the day dictate. So it's about creating reciprocal obligations, establishing norms, creating a culture of political contact and engagement that leads to higher levels of cooperation. It's a security agenda in a broad economic sense. It's also about leverage, and I think this is particularly important in, in this part of the world about voice in international organization and international geopolitics. Does the EAC speak with a louder voice than any of the individual country members can speak? Um, but the challenge, as I said, is that with the aggregate gains come the distributional tensions. And at any level of regional integration, you get this, the following sort of tension, that the consumption gains, the gains to you as consumers, are often quite broadly distributed. The cost of goods falls, the access to variety increases, the gains on the consumption side are generally quite broadly distributed within the region, but the costs and the income distribution are highly concentrated. The costs in terms of production gains and losses and income effects, gains and losses, are often highly concentrated within countries and between countries. This comes about through processes of agglomeration and clustering. So there are great advantages to being the first mover in a monetary union, for example, to establish clusters of production. We know that trade creation and trade diversion has similar distributional effects. I won't spend any time on those. We know that changes in the common external tariff affect different parts of a regional grouping enormously. I'll mention one example of that in, in, in a moment. Um, and we get these cumulative effects. Regional development becomes highly path dependent. The, the first mover advantage creates the high rate of return locations that make sense to service through improved infrastructure. And the improved infrastructure 
makes it more attractive to firms to agglomerate in those high productivity areas. Skills get concentrated, universities get concentrated, and the process of regional integration creates processes of disintegration or, or distributional tension. That's absolutely independent of common monetary areas, deep integration, that's, a, that's going to be a feature of any customs union uh, or regional integration process, a customs union or a single market. And history just gives us so many examples of, of why those tensions are extremely difficult to deal with. I talked about the change in external tariffs in a, in a monetary union. In the run-up to the American Civil War, there were a number of cases where tariff changes were pushed through by the northern states of the union. The northern states produced manufactured goods and consumed agricultural goods from the south. The south produced agricultural goods and consumed the manufactured goods. What happens if you increase the external tariff on manufactured goods, as the northern states of the US did in the 1820s, 30s, 40s? That shifts the terms of trade against the south. Now, this is not a theory of, of the American Civil War, but it's an important part of the underlying tensions that are there. Um, the most famous example of this, it was called the Tariff of the Abominations in, in uh, the late 1820s. Closer to my home, the Irish potato famine in the 1840s was massively exacerbated by the role of the common external tariff that the English government had essentially established that protected grain and exposed the producers of potatoes to enormous terms of trade shocks. These things create enormous tensions. Many people this morning have mentioned the collapse of the first East African community in the mid-70s because of a perception of the maldistribution of the gains from regional integration. The consum consumption gains were widespread in the EAC, the production and income gains, and not just the current income gains, but the perception that foreign direct investment coming into the region was concentrating in one particular country at the expense of others. That's the fundamental tension that we're dealing with. Now, at an institutional level, one of the one of the key elements in, in European integration has been the role of structural and regional funds. An explicit recognition that a core element of any fiscal architecture must be able to address these core periphery problems, both in terms of a compensation sense of providing income support in the periphery, but also in a structural sense. How do you help uh, periphery countries and regions become more integrated with the core through infrastructure, become better able to transform their production structures through structural adjustment or training or other forms of, of, of adjustment. We've seen that work in, in a number of places in, in Europe quite effectively. In my final slide, I'll talk a little bit about the cost of doing that and thinking about how much are, part, are member states prepared to pay to lean against these underlying pressures. So let me take five minutes to say something about why I think the stakes get upped in the step from customs union to monetary union, when you move from a single market in goods and possibly in, in factors to a monetary union. And this is just some important macroeconomics, I think, that, that is fundamental, macro and fiscal issues that are fundamental to thinking about how uh, groupings of countries move forward um, if they are considering a move towards deeper, deeper integration. A monetary union is, is many things, but fundamentally it's about creating a common exchange rate and monetary framework coexisting with a decentralized fiscal arrangement. So centralized monetary policy, decentralized fiscal policy. So uh, national governments have full control over their fiscal policy, but they yield monetary policy to a supranational central bank. The European Central Bank is, is the obvious uh, example that we have, but it would be true for other um, uh, regions, including the regions of West Africa. Here's the, the challenge. The fundamental challenge is that, that, that the standard assignment of, of macroeconomic policy tools to the macro management problem, which has evolved in most parts of the world to one where you ask monetary policy to help with macroeconomic stabilization and you use fiscal policy 
to think about growth on the supply side and, and debt sustainability, that allocation comes under severe stress when the former is supranational and the latter is national. And that stress must be counteracted by some sort of institutional response. And I'm going to focus very briefly on two fundamental tensions. The first is the well-known one of the fiscal free rider problem. The bottom line from a fiscal free rider problem is that it creates a case for fiscal rules, for strong, enforceable, monitored, and credible fiscal rules across the union. The second tension that emerges is what I, I call the Walters critique. That's a very British term for, for a, a problem that I'll describe. The Walters critique is the consequences for, for macroeconomic management, for the conduct of monetary policy. Walters, um, a man called Alan Walters, was uh, economic advisor to Margaret Thatcher in the 1980s and probably did more than anybody to keep the UK out of the Eurozone. Um, his critique, I think, is extremely powerful and, and I want to spend a moment or two about talking about that. So, these are the two tensions that they create, um, that are created particularly by this separation of monetary to a supranational level and fiscal to a national level. The other point to keep bearing in mind is that neither of these tensions are self-correcting. So, a faith in markets is not sufficient to address these fundamental challenges in regional, deep regional integration. That markets will not self-correct these pressures for divergence. Or at least to the extent that they will self-correct, they will only do it at very high cost and in a violent way. We'll see what that might mean in a moment. Okay, so let me proceed. Just to break up the text, a couple of pictures of what macroeconomic divergence looks like. What do I mean by it? And this is from, from Europe. So here we have, um, you can, can't quite see it along the bottom, but it starts in 1999 with the creation of the euro, uh, and I've taken data up until 2008, the, the global financial crisis. There are a number of countries there, that's not all of Europe, but the key ones are the green one, green for Ireland, and uh, the yellow one, which is the sunshine of Spain. Okay, so yellow and green are our two periphery countries, and Blue is Germany, orange, of course, is, is Holland or the Netherlands, and the black line in the middle is the Eurozone as a whole. And you will recall that after decades of convergence criteria and trying to get into balance at the beginning of the Eurozone, countries came together. And this, is, this red bar sort of indicates the beginning of the Eurozone, the single currency. And what we're looking at here is output gaps, the growth in in, in output relative to the trend um, in, in the various different countries. And what is most striking is the runaway success of Ireland and Spain. This very rapid growth, which, if we run it a bit further forward, is self-correcting, but in the most violent way imaginable. The Eurozone crisis is building up as countries move further and further apart. How that comes about, we'll see uh, in a moment. The second thing is, there was never any exchange rate crisis, of course, in, in Europe. But exchange rate crises just disappear and are replaced by current account or credit crises. These are the same countries with the current account balance shown. And as you can see, divergence is the dominant feature of this graph. At the bottom, you have Spain and Ireland going into current account deficits through this period of five, six, seven, eight, ten percent of GDP. These are very, very large by historical standards for the region. And on the other side, you have Germany and the Netherlands going in the opposite direction. We're getting the build-up of enormous macro balance imbalances in, in the Eurozone. I'm going to come back to that in, in a moment. Uh, but first, I want to just talk about how do you respond to that? Well, one coherent and widely supported response is the view that monetary unions are incomplete institutions. They are unstable institutions, fundamentally. And the members of a monetary union have only two choices. Go forward or go back. Go forward with all deliberate speed or retreat back 
with all deliberate speed. Go forward, meaning full political integration. Internalize those tensions, those macroeconomic tensions, within a single political federation. Or retreat back to the point at which your institutional structure is sufficient to manage the tensions, the tensions of a trade area or a customs union. That's, that's one response. And what does history tell us about, about that view? Well, there's a famous thing called the 1999 Bank of England question, where the governor of the Bank of England came to his young research staff and said, I want you to just go and look at all possible examples of monetary union in history and tell me which ones have succeeded. And the answer is, ah, well, if we take Europe out of, the, out of the picture, the answer is, well, not really any. You're going to respond to me in a moment with some examples, but let's, let's stick with my story. Because the next line is, the ones, that, the ones that have succeeded, the answer is in the name. And they came up with three successful monetary unions. The answer is the name. Number one, the United Kingdom. Scotland was incorporated into a monetary union and wrapped up in a political union. Actually, in Scotland, it was a political union followed by a monetary union. The United States of America is a monetary union built around political union. And the third one they came up with was the United Republic of Tanzania, where Zanzibar and mainland Tanganyika form a political union inside which you have a monetary union functioning. Otherwise, the claim is, no, we do not have any examples. Now, of course, you're going to say, well, wait a minute. What about the Frank Zone, the, the West African Monetary Union, the Central African Monetary Union? What about the Common Monetary Area? What about the East Caribbean Currency Board? What about the small islands of, of the South Pacific in, in Monetary Union with, uh, with Australia and New Zealand? And the response is, yes, they all exist, but none of them are unions of equals. Unions of equals without an external player playing an important macroeconomic role in those unions. What you can't find around the world are monetary unions that stand guaranteed only by themselves as groups of equals. So the role of France in, and the French Treasury in helping to guarantee convertibility is, is critical in um, in West Africa. The role of the Reserve Bank of South Africa or the role of South Africa in the CMA is absolutely dominant. There's not really, that's not really a monetary union. That's a group of small countries deciding let's hitch our wagon to a big one. Likewise in the East Caribbean or elsewhere. So there is a view that the concept of a monetary union as a union amongst equals is a very fragile one. It's an unstable equilibrium. That is a view. And here is a quote from one of the, the leading scholars on European monetary inter integration, a guy called Paul de Grau. And it's worth just reading this, this out um, to make the point. It, he wrote this a couple of years ago. And it was, what lessons do you draw from Europe for East Asia? But you could apply it here. It says, the only governance that can be sustained in the Eurozone is one where a Eurozone government, backed by a Eurozone parliament, acquires the powers to tax and spend. This will also be a government that will prevail over the central bank in times of crises and not the other way around. This will also be a government that has the political legitimacy to impose macroeconomic and budgetary policies aimed at avoiding imbalances. Put differently, the Eurozone can only be sustained if it is embedded in a fiscal and political union. So there's the challenge. That is, that is the challenge from one, one wing. The second response is no. Deep integration can be rendered stable with sufficient investment in the institutions required to do so. So it's the institutions required to manage divergence. Now that will require a degree of pool sovereignty, possibly more than most uh, member states are comfortable with at present. But the argument is that with the right in investment, uh, regional integration with monetary union is a sustainable, at least over the, uh, the medium term. Okay. 
What it requires is investment in capacity, credibility and governance at both the national and the supranational level. It requires really powerful surveillance mechanisms and enforcement, political enforcement of economic policy regimes is critical. It requires structural instruments at, at a deep level to deal with that core periphery problem that exists, but it also requires stabilization instruments in order to allow macroeconomic management to be implemented successfully. And what I want to do in my last five minutes or so is just talk about that, that macro problem and why these two tensions that I mentioned earlier are so fundamental and must be central to the way in which we think about the macroeconomic engagement on, um, on deep integration. So it's standard to think about this, this separation that monetary policy is responsible for macroeconomic stabilization to give you stable inflation and, and limit the volatility of output and fiscal policy is concerned with long-run solvency, i.e. debt, with growth and distribution. Let's see how they get challenged. The first is the fiscal rider, free rider problem. This is familiar to, to anyone who, who's thought for a moment about these problems, either in a regional integration sense or if you find yourself living in a, in a federal uh, structure. Um, this is the classic free rider problem. National governments or, or federal state governments, for example, make fiscal choices. They have fiscal instruments at their disposal and they make these subject to a rule. For example, a debt ceiling or a deficit ceiling. And at any point in time, they've got two choices. They can either observe the rule or they can violate the rule. Supranational authorities, that could be a council of ministers or the supranational central bank or any other governance institution, must decide what to do if there's violation. And they have two choices, accommodate the violation or punish the violation. Now, you only have to look at this little tree for a moment and you think, I can see what the equilibrium or the, the, um, the most likely outcome from this game is going to be. And it's simple. Because punishing is difficult, penalizing is difficult for political reasons, either because the victims of, of, a, of a penalty will be the people, the poor, the people you're trying to protect, or because there's a solidarity consideration, I will not penalize you today because I think maybe tomorrow I need you to be gentle on me, sort of solidarity club type of reasons. That's fully understood, which means that all institutions at the national level have a well-defined incentive to violate fiscal rules. That's the fundamental problem that most federal systems and, and monetary unions are going to face, that the incentives are going to be to violate the rule and to accommodate the violation. That's going to be a dominant political outcome. What does that lead to? That leads to a very strong emphasis on the role of fiscal rules. Rules that, for example, are written into the protocol for the East African community. Rules that are written into the Maastricht Treaty and the Stability and Growth Pact in, in Europe. An attempt to try and establish strong fiscal rules. Fiscal rules with no flexibility. That's the key point, no flexibility. My penultimate point here, and before I finish, because I know I'm going on a little bit too long. The challenge is that the Walters critique requires the opposite. It requires fiscal flexibility. It requires fiscal flexibility. Why is that? Well, here's the problem, that a single common monetary policy is generally not going to be appropriate for any individual country in the Union. And more than that, that single common monetary policy may well be positively destabilizing for countries in a monetary union. So monetary policy may be not just suboptimal, but destabilizing. This is the essence of the, the Walters critique. How is that? Well, think of the following example. And what matters if you think about your monetary policy is the real interest rate, the interest rate after inflation. That's what squeezes aggregate demand if you're con conducting monetary policy. Imagine an individual country, let's call it Ireland for the sake of example, has a runaway growth in domestic credit. It's feeling excessively buoyant, 
you get rapid growth, you get overheating of that economy, you get inflation in that economy. Now, what would a central bank of Ireland do if it could? It would increase its interest rates. It would tighten the monetary policy to raise real interest rates and squeeze aggregate demand and bring that overheating under control. Okay, what's the problem? Suppose the interest rate is not set by the Bank of Ireland, but by the European Central Bank. Ireland is tiny compared to Europe as a whole. That interest rate in the European Central Bank is going to respond to a whole lot of factors, not necessarily Ireland's overheating. So, imagine the interest rate doesn't increase. Well, what's happening in, in Ireland? You've got a low interest rate and rising inflation. So what direction is the real interest rate, the thing that matters, going? It's not increasing, it's going the other way. Exactly at the time when you want to tighten your monetary policy, being part of a monetary union moves it in the wrong direction. So you are stoking this overheating economy. It's getting hotter and hotter because you do not have the monetary policy instrument to do the right thing. So, what do you need? What do you need to do? You need another instrument. And what is that instrument? How do you take aggregate demand out of the Irish economy? You need fiscal policy. You need discretion on fiscal policy, on public expenditure, on taxation. There's the fundamental tension that comes at the macroeconomic level within a monetary union. And here's the, here's the story. Um, early 2000s, Ireland is overheating. What happens to the interest rate? Well, it rises a little bit because Germany isn't overheating. Actually, Germany is in a recession. So then the ECB starts to lower its interest rates because it's worried about the Eurozone, i.e. mainly Germany. As those interest rates lower and inflation in Ireland rises and Spain, boom, they've got these negative real interest rates below the line here. They're the ones that have got the wrong macro policy. There are no fiscal signals. Everything looks great on the fiscal front. There's no fiscal action and no pressure from the centre to take offsetting fiscal action. The reason is, if you're in a boom, your tax receipts look really good, especially if you're in a real estate boom, which is Ireland and Spain. So they were just going superbly well on the fiscal front. Big surpluses, everything's fine, but actually everything was absolutely not fine because they were following fiscal rules and not fiscal discretion. And what do I mean by that? There's the adjustment. The Eurozone, this is the 2008 crisis, the Eurozone has a bit of a tough time. Look at Ireland and Spain. That's a direct consequence of this incomplete fiscal architecture that I was talking about. Okay, last two or three minutes, Mr. Chair, uh, if I may. So, the tension is there. Fiscal rules to try and offset the temptation to act in a free-riding manner. Free-riding means that other countries are carrying the cost of your fiscal indiscipline. Hit that with rules versus the Walters critique that says you need the fiscal flexibility to complement the absence of monetary flexibility in a monetary zone. How do you square this off? And that's my final couple of points. The three key elements, and I'm just going to talk about them as funds, because beneath that there's a whole set of political economy and, and uh, political issues. You need structural instruments and structural funds to deal with the fundamental uh, tensions in any regional integration. These are budgetary commitments. These are not meant to be symmetric over time. Some countries will be structurally more dependent on these funds than others. This means that some countries will be paying into the structural funds in perpetuity and some will be drawing them down in perpetuity. That is a political tension. That's why my government at home says we don't like to pay all this money into the European Union when Ireland and Greece and Portugal take it all. That's an absence of political solidarity. That's a structural point. Stabilisation funds are the way in which you try and address the Walters critique. It's about creating a framework that allows for fiscal or quasi-fiscal complementary policy to allow countries to manage the short-run macroeconomics without getting into this severe divergence problem that's created by the common monetary policy. 
Stabilization facilities, the obvious model for this, in a sense, is the IMS program. The IMS program, particularly during the period of fixed exchange rates from 1945 to 1971. That's exactly how these, the, the funds programs worked. It was about providing resources under surveillance, rules, and conditionality to allow countries to respond to shocks in a way that is least disruptive to domestic economic activity. That's what a stabilization facility is about. This should be self-financing. It should be, if, it's, if these are cyclical shocks, it should be self-financing, not a structural issue. And the final thing is a lender of last resort, a fundamental role for a central bank to provide short-term liquidity to the financial sector. Why I mention that at the end is that as soon as you move into a monetary union, you lose not just monetary policy, but you unravel the notion that any national government can monetize its debt. Domestic debt, domestic currency debt, the seniorage revenue of the, of the nation state, is gone. There's collective seniorage, but it's not national. And so you're turning domestic debt into essentially foreign debt, or debt to the union as a whole. That creates a lot of liquidity problems and lender of last resort facilities, which were shockingly absent in Europe in conventional ways, if they exist in, in non-conventional ways. Those facilities are crucial. Okay, they cost. They cost a lot, and this will be my, my final point. Um, how much does it cost to do this? We've only one really good example, and that is, that is Europe. Structural funds are approximately 1% slightly more, of European GDP. Sorry, no, the European budget is about that. The structural funds are about 40% of the budget. So that's not, that's not a lot of money for a group of rich countries. But if you think of 1% of GDP in an environment where, say, um, revenue is maybe 15 to 20% of, of GDP, scale that up by a factor of five. If you're talking about, just for structural funds, maybe about 5% or for, for a budget that supports structural funds, maybe 5% of total revenue in a monetary union. Any of you from the East African community might have, like to have a look at how much member states currently pay to the East African community, or more precisely, currently do not pay. Um, I think every country is in arrears, and the amount that's currently contributed to the EAC budget is absolutely tiny. It's nowhere near 5% of revenue. So it's a really interesting scale issue. Stabilization funds, way more expensive, but they can be financed through bond markets to some extent. In Europe, you're talking about 4 to 5% of European GDP. That's a huge number. It can be engineered in a way that it's not quite as large as that, but it is a very substantial financial commitment, a commitment that's required if the twin tensions of the Walters critique and the fiscal free rider problem can be reconciled in an efficient way. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, <laughs> Professor Adam, for being so provocative. I'm sure the audience is very much provoked. <laughs> thank you very much. But now um, it remains, uh, I don't want to steal his thunder, it remains to Gibson uh, to, to make some comments on this. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. May I start really by thanking the ARC for providing me this opportunity and thank uh, Professor Chris Adams for a very rich uh, presentation. I also had the opportunity to read through the paper, which I think he has really summarized the paper, but there's a lot in the paper, which is uh, very rich. Um, I think he started by asking the question, why deep regional integration. Is this the path that we want uh, to go? And I think he concurred with the sentiments that were coming in this morning that uh, yes, regional integration is good for us. We need to proceed with re regional integration. But this session being what it is, to rethink regional integration, I think there are a number of issues that have been raised in the presentation as well as in the paper with regards to 
uh, rethinking. Firstly, if you look at the uh, progression of uh, regional integration that he, he showed, uh, the question is, uh, are we moving the full scale? What is the timing of, uh, framework? When should we be there? And also, basing from history, countries that have gone, we're looking at, I think in the paper he cites the European Union, as one of the examples that uh, most of the countries, particularly in, in Africa, have been looking at. If we look at that rate, their rate of progression and the institutions that they have built over time and the pace at which we are going, do we have the requisite ins institutions that can then support that, that growth? I think uh, in the paper is highlighted that one of the lessons, uh, key lessons that you can learn from uh, Europe is one, the depth of the institutional foundation. So I think the one issue that you need to grapple with as we uh, look at the issues that we have raised is the depth of our institutional foundations within our regional economic communities, as well as the other element which we touched last, which I'll also come back to, is the issue of financial and other commitments. Because that's key. Regional integration is an expensive process that also requires adequate resourcing to be able to uh, carry out some of the mandates that they are. And particularly the issue that he was talking about, they are winners and losers. You need to compensate. There are all those, those structural funds that are there. So that's the point he, he raised. And he also raised the issue of whether we are too ambitious on this agenda or not. We need to reflect on that. We also need to reflect on something he highlighted, whether if the monetary union has all these costs, do we revert back to consolidation of the customs union or a customs union or the, the single market or we go all the way? I think it's raised in the paper and I also uh, come back and uh, highlight uh, some of those uh, uh, issues. But the other issue that he also highlighted and I think uh, it's, it's, it's also coming in the uh, uh, presentation as well as in the paper, the issue of political commitment towards having a political uh, a federation. And commitment is one thing, but resourcing is another. Then the other aspect that I picked in his presentation, and it came through much strongly in the paper, is that, uh, particularly in the paper, he highlighted that creation of a single currency within the context of a monetary union is not a technical uh, monetary step because it's an easy thing, and if you look at the time frames that we've set ourselves, it appears that within two years we'll achieve a monetary union. But there are a number of steps, there are a number of tensions which he highlighted, and tensions which uh, will not necessarily lead to the outcome that we deserve. It, there are tensions that will bring in uh, political resistance. He highlighted the issue that some of these concepts, uh, regional integration, it's not just an economic concept, but we are also looking at the political considerations. So it's not a, 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 a simple technical step. It's about real economic integration, pooling of economic sovereignty. There are aspects that we are talking about, the institutions that we need to set up, which are supranational institutions. For you to have them, you then have to cede some political power to that supranational institution. The question that we need to uh, digest is what is the appetite among our politicians? to seed that uh, sovereignty. If you had the discussions that we had early in the morning, I think issues were coming up about national versus regional interest, which tells you that there could be attention in terms of seeding that supranational uh, uh, or, or, I mean, authority, sovereignty to, to our, uh, for our nation states to a supranational national body. And also the process places demands on national as well as the various supranational fiscal institution in terms of how this whole thing uh, and project can be funded. I think he highlighted in the paper as well as in the discussions in terms of the economic benefits of regional integration. I, I think there's no contention in that area in terms of the largeness of the market, scales you know, of economy, having common infrastructure. I think those areas are, are, are pretty agreeable. But there are other issues that are uh, where you're looking at the challenges of ensuring that the growth payoffs to regional integration is balanced, 
inclusive, which I think the prof did highlight. And it is those areas of costs and how these distributional co these costs are shared across countries uh, begin to uh, provide some threats. I think in the paper he called them e existential threats that can arise. So we need to look at how those uh, uh, threats can actually be uh, resolved. And he did talk about uh, the monetary union not being a, a stable uh, and political equilibrium where countries face uh, the two choices that he talked about. Uh, advancing uh, and possibly rapidly towards a full and credible political union, such as the political federation envisaged in the European uh, uh, African, I mean East African community, and I think it's also in SADAC as well. So I think the question is, uh, which we need to interrogate this, this aspect, this choice, given the instability of the next stage of deepening uh, uh, regional integration. Do we consolidate? Do we retreat? If we don't, and we want to proceed to the next step, which requires us to have the various supranational institutions, are we prepared? And with the time it takes, how long? So it's, I think those are issues that we need to interrogate. Then there's the aspect of retreating back to a much looser structure of regional uh, integration and uh, based on customs union and single market. I, I like the analysis he, he did in the paper, which uh, was not highlighted in his presentation, but he talked about some of the evidence from, from, from history. And I picked in the paper where he is looking at the case of the UK, for example, which was in the uh, Eurozone, but uh, it was not a member of the Eurozone, but a member of the, uh, uh, it remained a member of the EU before the BRIC exit, but chose not to participate in the Eurozone. In other words, it was benefiting from the benefits of a customs union, the benefits of a single market, but they didn't go the next step. The same, I think, is also in the paper where he talked about, at no stage, Canada and US in their free trade areas agreement in the 1980s, or its successor, NAFTA, uh, uh, they, there is, uh, in, the, in, in that case, there's a view that there's regional uh, economic integration uh, and the integrity of the, the, uh, the, the free trade area, but there's an absence of the monetary union. The ASEAN nations as well, I think it's highlighted in the paper, uh, they've made significant progress, and I think it was highlighted in the morning. But the point I like from, from what you were said, while they made that progress, they have been discussing the issue of uh, moving to the next level of a monetary union, but that has not happened. Then also, uh, when, so what this is saying, it highlights the questions, the options that he has talked about. Given the tensions that are there, should we move to the next stage? And if we move to the next stage, I think he has highlighted and amplified the tension. We then need to look at how do we mitigate some of those risks. And I think that's, uh, I think, the purpose of uh, this rethinking. Then, in doing so, uh, if we go to the next level of the monetary union and there is need for creating of those supranational uh, institutions, which then create fiscal as well as risk uh, sharing uh, mechanisms, there is need to look at how greater coordination of uh, fiscal issues are done. I think he did talk about some of the political consideration of regional integration where you are bringing in uh, solidarity to ensure that uh, you move together as, as a region. But the history of implementing or non-implementation for that matter of regional integration initiatives uh, suggests that commitment is not followed by resources. If we look at uh, in creating supranational institutions, if you look at the, the regs for instance, how are these regs currently funded? Are we fully funding them as a region? Or they are being funded by development partners, which creates a challenge of sustainability of these institutions and the work that they do. Then there's also the issue of providing the enabling uh, framework. It's one thing to have the commitment. It's one thing to decide that you want to have these institutions. But you then need to have the enabling uh, frameworks, uh, legal frameworks, which then brings in the role of our parliament in this whole debate. Uh, so establishing and, uh, and sustainability of supranational institutions require substantial financial commitments of our government, as well as facilities, including the structural and stabilization funds that we did talk about. 
and also within the addressing the issue of the free rider problem uh, that, that he highlighted. And I think within the context of the European Union, this is one area they, they, they worked on and providing the institutions that can be able to deal with that. Then he did talk about the uh, upping of uh, regional aggression uh, into the next level. I think the point he raised is that the central policy challenge facing policymakers is that when countries are faced with monetary union, they accept the centralized common monetary and exchange rate policy, which is managed by uh, the central uh, bank. But the point he also raised that uh, then the okay the point he also raised that the fiscal policy is at government level that in itself creates a huge tension which needs to be addressed and I think this is where the stabilization fund uh, uh, comes in I'm told my time is up but I think one other area that we did talk about is some of the challenges and the policy coordination challenges that face uh, the ma common monetary union and I think this is an area that we need to look at and digest and be able to come up conclusively uh, with uh, uh, the way forward. I think the last point, uh, Chair, I see my time is up, where you were talking about rules versus uh, discretion. I think we are in the realm of the moral hazard uh, problem and the too big to fail kind of phenomena where you also have implicit guarantees. So it's an area that really needs to be looked at uh, closely and see how those loopholes uh, can be uh, corrected through an institutional uh, framework to manage some of the, uh, the, 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 the challenges. I think I'll rest my case here. Chair. Thank you. So I'll move over now to, to the audience and to add to what has been done to challenge, if you challenge, um, and then maybe cut a, a, a better way forward, maybe, maybe move the whole or something. Uh, Doctor, you, you know, farmer. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I, I had Dr. Newman, but at the back. Okay. Yeah. Dr. Newman, I'm behind you. Uh, please thank introduce yourself so that uh, others get to know you. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Richard Newfarmer. I'm the country director for the International Growth Center uh, for Uganda and uh, Rwanda. Uh, thank you very much, Professor, for a very fine explanation of uh, the tensions in uh, uh, regional trade agreements and regional monetary unions. And, and likewise, I thought the comment was absolutely brilliant. Two quick questions. One is, it seems to me that the tensions that you describe might be heightened in a situation in which economies are rather small, commodity exporting, and therefore subject to external shocks of price volatility on, on the market, and that particularly uh, works to the disadvantageous uh, conduct of a collective monetary and fiscal policy when the shocks affect countries differentially. So the question is, do these uh, uh, differential shocks possibly uh, create tensions in the EAC, for example, that require even more uh, attention to the stabilization fund and put more stress on the institutions? That's the first question. And I wonder if there's been any modeling that would kind of uh, uh, show that. The second is, and it, it's a way of maybe putting the, the question that uh, Mr. Quartara put to you as well, which is the usefulness of working on what uh, has been called in the e European Union context the convergence agenda. In other words, coordinating macro policy, coordinating trade, po uh, ter uh, sorry, uh, tax policy, uh, thinking about disciplines on export subsidies within the region or disciplines on industrial policy, working at the regional level to ensure that there is a common uh, approach leading to uh, a better, first of all, uh, customs union uh, and single market, and eventually laying the stage for uh, uh, monetary union should that occur. 
The question is, can the monetary union be a useful sort of goal, even if you work on this convergence agenda? And if so, what are the steps, what are the highlights, what are the issues on that convergence agenda that you would lay out? Okay, thank you. I'm Abi Kader from University of Sheffield in the UK. Uh, I have uh, three points. Uh, briefly, I will make first uh, reference okay. to the... Okay. okay. Can you hear me now? Uh, okay. okay. Uh, I'm Abi Kader from University of Sheffield in the UK. I have one question with regard to coordination, uh, which is a point well articulated by uh, Frani and you highlighted it. Uh, uh, that is in reference to the political coordination for the centralized monetary policy. Uh, when we look at some coordination pillars in the past, the role of trust is very, very important. And I would be happy if you make uh, some comment on, the, on that point. The second point is about the experience of European Union and what Africa can learn from the pace and the form of uh, integration that is taking place there. Uh, and uh, or what is happening in Europe, whether it can inform what is going on in our continent. And the final point is just a simple macro policy uh, question on the stabilization uh, role of fiscal policy. Uh, as we know, uh, the role for fiscal policy within uh, developing countries or emerging economies is very limited because uh, they tend to be uh, pro-cyclical. Uh, therefore, the burden on monetary policy uh, is, I think, is very obvious. Therefore, uh, what role do they really uh, play? Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, my name is Joel Sinsu from the Ministry of Investment, Trade and Industry in Botswana. Um, I would like to thank the uh, Professor Adams and Dr. Chikumira for the presentations they've given to us. Um, I have a question for, uh, that is applicable to both of you. Um, looking at the experience of the Eurozone, uh, the, in the analysis and discussions that you have given to us, uh, the tensions that is there in, in terms of moving to deeper regional integration, uh, the issue of winners and losers and uh, and, uh, 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 you know, when you look at countries at different levels of development, is it not uh, like it may be wise that uh, there could be a certain level of development or, or where should, in terms of the, uh, the steps to, uh, say, monetary union, maybe for certain countries there is a level where we should stop. If I look at, say, African countries, it might be wise to define and say, okay, for countries at the level of this development, countries with a mixture of developing and more developed countries, this kind of mixture of the regional integration, they would be better place if they, they go into integration to this level and then after a certain level of development of the region, they move to the uh, next stages. Uh, otherwise, from the discussion, it appears like uh, if you look at it, uh, it may be difficult, especially for us in, in, in developing countries, to move to those stages of monetary union and others. Thank you very much. And this presentation is a journey of regional integration and Chris has shown us the end road of that journey, which is when you have what he call the political union. Before that, you need to have a monetary union. Now, from the presentation, we thought that the three countries that have achieved that political union, which he mentioned to us, UK, USA, and Tanzania, are those that have uh, achieved complete, in other words, politics was united with economics in the sense that it ended up being one country. 
uh, we couldn't lay much emphasis on the issue of what happened in Australia or New Zealand, where one country remains, and some people are latching on it. So it means that, other than this, we have no other example <coughs> to say that this is where we're heading to in terms of achieving the end point. The stage before the end point, which is the monetary union, European Union can have been an example for us to work towards where that still remains one today. But in the next five years, we don't know whether anybody's gonna pull out or not. But the UK that we were hoping that one day was eventually going to join the European Union, we now know that that is not gonna be. So the question back to us in terms of the thinking is Africa, when we're talking of regional integration, what really do we mean? Where are we going? We mentioned industrialization in the morning that we are looking forward to East Asia, the Asian Tigers, for us to do what they did, many of them, have we been able to do what? And then the dream is on regional integration. One point that has struck me so much is when Chukuchuku was talking, he reminded us that if you have an airport at the middle of the city in your own country that is gonna connect to the rest of the world, you are on course on integration. So we need, as we're going back from this place, to really know what is realistic and what is not, so that when we talk about this regional integration, which we have been hearing in terms of is the way to go, is going forward, no going back, where are we going and what do we mean? So maybe we may have to have another conference on monetary union so that we know where we're going and then begin to implement realistic goals. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Chair. I have uh, two questions, one for Professor Adam and the other for Dr. Chigumira. On, uh, for Professor Adam, you mentioned that uh, we would need solutions uh, that are structural, uh, but also um, both on the fund side and the instrument side. It's easier to create funds, it's harder to manage them sustainably. It's harder to create institutions, but once they're in place, they do function. Could you give us uh, your thoughts on where you think different regions of Africa can be served by one or the other and what we should be thinking about in, in going forward with those types of uh, responses? And then, uh, Dr. Chigumira, um, I wanted to, to ask you uh, if you would uh, share any examples that you have observed uh, in the different regional groupings we have of centrifugal forces that are, are beginning to tear apart whatever progress has been achieved thus far. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. Um, I think I've enjoyed the very much uh, the presentation. And thinking about the deepening. Can you introduce yourself? Uh, my name is uh, Rose Ngugi uh, from Kipra, uh, Kenya. Um, thinking about uh, deepening uh, uh, integration in, East, in the African continent. I'm trying to ask myself, um, same thing as my colleague, where are we going? In the sense that uh, we have a very good route that you've taken us through, uh, FTA, customs union, political union. But then if you think about East African community, we are at a different stage. SADAC, we are at a different stage. Uh, we have now uh, what we are calling the tripartite. I don't know where it's supposed to take us, uh, if we take the EEC, COMESA, and SADAC. And then we also have a new initiative, uh, the African Union, and this is the CFTA. All of them at very different uh, stages. When we talk about deepening, what are we talking about? Is it the several blocks deepening among themselves? or the continent itself uh, gaining some uh, deepening uh, as far as the integration is concerned. I'm a bit uh, not, not clear what is the deepening we are talking about. Thank you. We will take the second round. So now I would like to go to our speaker and discuss and to address what has been raised here. Thank you. These are great questions, thank you very much. Um, and uh, as you probably gathered from my presentation, I could take another 45 minutes just answering them, but I won't. Um, I know it's, it's late in the day. Um, 
let me just pick up a, a few of these as I go through, and then I'll, I'll uh, pass it over to, to Gibson. Um, I think Richard made a really interesting point about um, are these tensions magnified if you're dealing with um, groupings where countries are, are resource dependent, so shocks may be, may be larger, but more importantly, that they're differentially resource dependent across the union. So uh, a fall in the oil price might be great for an oil importer, but not so good for an oil exporter. And if they are in a, in a monetary union, what sort of tension does that place on the institutions of the monetary union when uh, one part is, is arguing for a, either a tightening of, of um, monetary policy, the other for, for a loosening of monetary policy. Um, I think that's, that's absolutely right. There is some modeling on this. Um, I, I got one of my graduate students to work, to work on this. And of course, being economists, it was all very straightforward because they used the wrong model and it was all too slick. And we didn't actually grapple with the, uh, with the political economy of this. There was quite a lot of work done in the run-up to the European Union on exactly these sorts of issues. And one of the conceits, I think, at that time was the point that I raised earlier, that a lot of these tensions are not self-correcting. And there was a, a fairly strong confidence in markets and in, in deep convergence rather than divergence, that the process of creating a monetary union would lead to greater synchronization of business cycles, which in turn makes a common monetary policy more appropriate for more of the union more of the time, and so uh, kind of reduces those, those tensions. Um, I think the evidence from, from Europe suggested that was a, a false optimism, um, at least given the institutional structures at the time. Um, so I think this issue about, about strongly differential uh, production structures is, is really important. One way of thinking about it is it really does raise the stakes for, for any um, pooled fiscal intervention, be it stabilization or, or, or structural. Um, but on your second point, uh, the focus on the convergence agenda, I'd make two quick observations. One, hitting the initial convergence criteria is in some sense necessary, but as my picture suggested, far from sufficient for, for the effective continuation of a monetary union. But I, I do very much support your second point, that does, does the, the notion that there's a medium-term commitment to deeper integration serve as a valuable focal point for better policy coordination in, in the interim? And I think the answer is absolutely yes. And I think this part of the world highlights that. Um, in 2013, the heads of state made a commitment in the monetary union protocol. And the idea is a movement towards monetary union by 2024. Mm. I think that's highly unlikely, except by accident. Um, and it would be quite a dangerous accident if it occurred. But what is happening in terms of uh, coordination on information sharing, cross-border clearance, uh, and settlement in the financial sector, thinking about the regulatory framework for cross-border capital flows, thinking about harmonization of, of policy, policy coordination, policy dialogue, I think it's a, a really positive spillover from this initiative that has been going on over the last five or six years. The problem is we've got to play a, a trick that that works if, the, if people believe that there is an end point, but if at the same time you're saying we don't believe in the end point, there's a question about how credible that convergence agenda is. Um, on Kadir's points, um, uh, the experience of the European Union for this part of the world is really important, but with a very important caveat, that when you look at the protocol for East African uh, Monetary Union, this is a bit that I know best from, from Europe, but it was a blueprint It was a story of success. It was a story that said, Here's how you introduce a monetary union. Here's how you do a single currency. This is the governance and institutional structure you need. So it, the protocol looks like the Maastricht Treaty, which I think is a, a real danger. But I think the really important point to take away is that l'Europe se fera en crise. The crisis of 2010 has led to quite a profound rethinking about the governance structures within Europe. And it's that rethinking that the countries of, of sub-Saharan Africa need to focus on, not not the architecture of, of Maastricht, it's, it's what's happened since. And so the, the various reforms that themselves are still very incomplete, but I think they give us a better sense of, of some of the challenges there. Um, you're absolutely right on the fiscal policy, the, the pro-cyclicality. 
um, I think, A, what that does, it's certainly true if you had good automatic stabilizers and a lot of transferable fiscal structure, Walter's critique problem is much less severe. But given that fiscal policy is quite pro-cyclical, that just says the stakes are even higher when you're thinking about how important stabilization uh, and fiscal flexibility is. Um, I'm dodging your first question, but I might come back to it in a second about, about trust and coordination. Um, is there a level of development? I think, it, I think Gibson made the point very clearly that one of the key things about the European Union experience is the depth of institutional uh, foundations. I think that's what you look at. It's partly the, the structure of economies. Does it make sense to think about these very differently structured economies together in running a common monetary and trade policy? But it also depends on whether you feel that the political and fiscal institutions are deeply enough grounded to sustain the required cooperation to make uh, an institution work. And I suspect the answer to that is one that says customs union, free trade, SACU type of arrangements, those, those work quite well. Let's not move too quickly. You've got to remember that this story started in Europe in 1960, not, in, not 10 years ago. Um, two very quick final points. Um, the East Asian story, I think, is really interesting. Um, and there, it goes back to this point about regional integration as a focal point without tying countries' hands. The Chiang Mai Initiative is a very powerful cooperative economic arrangement uh, that does not bind the hands of, of um, uh, members of the Chiang, Chiang Mai Initiative to the point where they're kind of uh, straining against the, the, the fiscal obligations and the sovereignty obligations. And finally, uh, no, penultimately, Franny, uh, I think one of the, the interesting points is what I, I said. I think the, the examples of institutions that work this may not sit comfortably with people, but in a sense, the governance structures and the surveillance structures operated by the IMF give us quite a lot of the elements of a, an institutional structure that may be important to supporting deeper regional integration. But the key thing is thinking about the power and authority of the executive board and the governing council of institutions like that as much as it is about the systems of surveillance, the human capital required to make surveillance effective, and the level of political engagement required to, to negotiate uh, agreements. Um, but you're absolutely right, dead easy to create a fund, much harder to monitor it well and, and have it on a sound institutional basis. So let me pass to... to, to okay. Uh, thank, thank you very much. I think most of the issues have been addressed by uh, Chris. I think from the issue that was raised on the issue of uh, fiscal policy being uh, pro-cyclical, and I think there is evidence, even in our own context, that most of the instability that's happening in our country is the money supply as well as uh, inflation. And on the issue of fiscal policy having uh, uh, automatic stabilizers, I think there is evidence that African context means uh, the point you are raising that it's not self-correcting, the, the fiscal system is not self-correcting. You then need a deliberate intervention to be able to uh, address that. And if there is an institution, then that institution has to respond timelessly and uh, appropriately, otherwise it will respond when the cycle has already uh, changed. Um, I think on the issue that was raised by uh, uh, Joe, I think on the European experience, in, uh, in, 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 uh, in college, I think it was the issue of borrowed credibility. I think peripheral states within uh, Europe, they joined the monetary union, uh, European monetary union, as a way of also ensuring that there is policy uh, credibility and reputation of the, of the policy makers. But again, uh, with some of the challenges that they've obtained, uh, some of the, when they were trying to meet the convergence criteria, things begin to, to surface. And I think the point that Chris raised that some of the countries that have been perpetually paying into the stabilization fund begin to feel that this is now a permanent arrangement rather than a temporal and transitory arrangement where you are helping a country to move out of a crisis. But if you are perpetually in a crisis 
and there is evidence of some of these free rider problems, then it affects the entire uh, group because there are evidence of moral hazard issues emerging. Then, uh, okay, I think on the issue of ADB, sure, that's the end game where we are going. But I think about us having realistic uh, goals and targets that we want to achieve. While we want to go there and we've made a commitment, what we tend to find sometimes we make, we, we, we push ourselves so hard and we have, we, we put timelines which we are not able to achieve. But it can also achieve another purpose. For your citizen and observers, they then begin to, you suffer from a credibility problem. If we set a goal and we don't achieve that particular goal and we extend it by another 10 years, it tells us something. Either we have not done diagnostic and critical analysis very well. So it's an area that we need to look at. That's where we want to go, but let's set, set realistic time frames and the roadmap that we are following. Then uh, from uh, Franny raised question of uh, some, some examples where we are beginning to see some of these uh, centrifugal forces happening. I think one of the issues that I think Prof. Uh, Chris did raise is that you do have some context-specific shocks that are country-specific, but that are not affecting the entire region. And that does force the regional authorities to change course. But for the country itself, that's a big challenge. And that then uh, ignites political tension and pressure because of that divergence to do other things. And that's why you are beginning to see a number of even uh, tax and tariff reforms that, were being, that have been made actually being reversed. In some cases, you see an increase in protectionism. In some cases, you also begin to see an increase in different forms of non-tariff barriers being instituted into, in, into places. Uh, Zimbabwe is a case in point uh, where when we went into hyperinflation and wanted a solution out of it, one way during the debate there is either we adopt uh, gold, full dollarization or I remember it actually being mentioned in uh, uh, one of the uh, budget statements that we are likely to then proceed into a monetary union. So that once we're in a monetary union, we have no need to be thinking about these other current arrangements. But this was a Zimbabwean problem. It was not a sadak wide problem. So which meant uh, the, the appetite of moving into a monetary union was a one country problem, but not a, an entire region. So there are uh, idiosyncratic shocks that do okay. And there is need of how do you address this? And this is where the supranational institution, which is well, 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 well resourced, can be able to address some of those challenges in time so that it doesn't destabilize the entire uh, uh, region. I think the other area you also see countries agree, protocols are produced to facilitate uh, implementation, but those protocols, they are not signed. And you then ask yourself, why are they not being signed? Countries are, countries are beginning to see certain things that they have not anticipated and they would rather defer signing of the protocol. I think that's all I would say. Thank you. Uh, I, I will just take uh, two more then we have to because we have run out of time. So please. Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, uh, once again, uh, Dick Kamganga from uh, Uganda National Farmers Federation. And uh, we, the farmers, we don't like ambiguity. We get confused every time the weather patterns are not properly predicted. And in this respect, I take to the, the precurrent uh, speaker from the audience asking, where are we going? Um, I would like to ask the African Economic Research Consortium, which is the largest capacity building uh, and think tank in the, in the, in the, on the continent, to rethink also its research agenda, such that this agenda can guide us and can guide these policy makers on finding exactly which direction we have to take. Uh, the, the question the, the good professor from Oxford asked, I think from Oxford, if I'm right, I mean, uh, the steps he took us through, where do we have the most gains as a region? 
what are the costs and benefits uh, for each of those regions, uh, for each of those stages. Do we need really to move for the monetary union if it is more costly for us? Uh, and people, as we are seeing an increasing sense of, others have called it responsible nationalism, others have called it uh, anti-globalization, but we have seen the increasing agitation against the global forces. And then we, the farmers, we do not know what exactly, which direction to say. So the question, the, my recommendation in this meeting, therefore as a farm is to the ARC to expand its research agenda to be precisely guide the policy makers on the continent. Where should we stop? Uh, and uh, on board on, on regional integration. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, so I, I was already speaking this morning, but I couldn't resist uh, coming back just on three, on three points. Because lots of the questions that have been raised are about what's the end game, how do we move through this process. But the stages that were presented, uh, which come from this Bella Balassa paper, right, of the different sort of levels of economic integration, are present, uh, we look at those as though they're a process that needs to be followed when in fact when they were sort of discussed where these are just different levels of integration. So that it's not necessarily that this is a path that needs to be followed. They're kind of, as you kind of suggested, there are, there are end points within which can be kind of chosen. So indeed, I think given the example of European Union, there's been this sort of implicit assumption that everything has to move forward, farther, forward, all the way to political federation. And I think my, my, my sense is that what's happening in reality, so now sort of the second point, is that in, in all of the African RECs, they're very far from supranational institutions. So even in ECOWAS, we have a commission which has a sort of a legal authority. In reality, these are intergovernmental bodies. And they're intergovernmental bodies where within the treaties and within the different protocols, there's a huge amount of flexibility actually built in. So sort of we talk uh, as though sort of countries are breaking the rules, but very often actually they're, they're following the rules or perhaps abusing the rules. But it's sort of that these rules are built in which then leads to this situation of maybe there isn't a kind of sense of having to go forward or go back. Maybe there is a possibility of having this kind of long-term limbo where there's a kind of consolidation and, and you kind of have this sort of proximity of people, which I think is a good point to raise. And then that just leads me to the, a, a third point on, on the EU story. I mean, so I guess my point is that it's not helpful always to look at the EU very much, but one point from the EU was the Treaty of Rome was in 1957. I think it was in 1982 there was a headline from is saying, is the EU dead or it's, or it's still born or something, or in a coma. And it's essentially after that that the European Round Table of Industrialists began to see the threat from sort of globalization elsewhere and the need for them to kind of establish this internal market. So it was in the 80s with this private sector drive that began to really create the momentum that then led to sort of re, re garnering some of this progress. So in a way, sort of what that raises to me is that, again, this role discussed this morning of sort of the different partners, who's, who needs this to happen? And also actually raises a question about to what degree does integration have to go through the regional organizations? I think lots of the things we also even discussed in infrastructure was about cooperation or cross-border collaboration. Somebody mentioned the tripartite or the, the Northern Corridor Group, which is not actually operating through the EAC and not actually sort of part of these wider things. This sort of multitude of different ways of cooperating regionally is perhaps something which is worth exploring more now, instead of sort of fixating on sort of an end goal which is, is not necessarily uh, realistic nor desirable at the moment. Bon, merci, Monsieur le Président, pour votre uh, indulgence. Uh, très rapidement, donc. Uh, on peut retenir que le problème des agendas africains, c'est un problème de crédibilité. Nous prenons des engagements et nous avons des difficultés à les tenir. Euh, mais je vais, euh, mon intervention porte sur deux points au moins. Euh, Lorsqu'on considère l'itinéraire de l'Europe, en 1996, il y a eu le pacte de stabilité qui disait, bon, dans tous les cas, en 1999, il y aura la monnaie unique avec les pays qui auront réalisé les critères de croissance. Cela veut dire qu'on peut faire une option euh, d'évolution à vitesse différenciée 
se dans une union monétaire et puis les autres progressivement vont y entrer. Euh, Est-ce que dans l'étude des situations africaines, que ce soit dans la zone euh, Afrique australe ou la zone ouest africaine, vos recherches vous ont permis peut-être d'étudier ce genre de situation euh, premier, euh, Première euh, observation. La deuxième, c'est finalement, euh, face à ce pessimisme-là, parce que l'intégration monétaire en Afrique, ce serait pour les calendes grecques, comme on dit en français, euh, Est-ce qu'il n'est pas possible d'envisager une alternative différente de ce qu'on peut appeler les externalités de l'intégration monétaire De faire en sorte que euh, même les optimales ne sont pas réalisées, en fait entièrement réalisées, qu'il y ait un niveau sous-optimal de telle sorte que le, la discipline collective aide à réaliser progressivement et qu'on avance sur le chemin de l'intégration monétaire et finalement de l'intégration économique. Merci. By the way, I'm Bernard, uh, Deputy Governor of Central Bank of Tanzania. Uh, in your presentation, you mentioned three examples of uh, successful monetary union, uh, which is the United Kingdom, United Republic of Tanzania, and the United States of America. And these were all presided by a political union, and then back to the monetary union. Even uh, with EU being successful at building some strong <coughs> institution, yet they, they haven't been able to record you know, a successful form of uh, monetary union. So the question is, do you think that should be the route for building a successful monetary union in Africa or in some of you know, the sub-regional integration? The political, uh, the political union. Yes. Thank you. These are enormous questions that uh, um, I, I didn't want to give the impression that there was a kind of determined. In, in, in the move through stages of, of, uh, of integration. Um, I actually took that from, um, from the website of the EAC. Um, talked about their, their pillar. Could, uh, be the same, it's a like different format. Now, whether this is just, uh, whether it's just a device, is a genuine intention, a device possibly structured stage, uh, or that this is a, a, a kind of a, an inevitable of questions. Um, and I certainly agree then that that um, I don't think there is. Uh, um, I think this, this way in which you describe a relatively stable, uh, quite flexible set of arrangements, I, I find that quite, um, uh, quite plausible. I think what is, what is interesting and dangerous is that you do have these to do it and without a little bit like like there's quite serious risks of premature uh, monetary integration uh, for the for the consequences of for the region um, my emphasis on, on learning from Europe is very much about the the governance structure for the monetary union um, uh, and I think you do have to be quite eurocentric about about this for the 
institutions that have been considered in this part of the world because there are no other examples of, and even Europe is not a, a union of equals as such. You still have to ask the question who plays the Bundesbank role in any of these monetary unions, where, where the big anchors are. But I think the understanding the, the process of learning from their own mistakes are quite useful in governance structure there. Um, is there a suboptimal route to um, two things? One is the variable convergence possibilities in this uh, suboptimal route towards monetary union. Um, I think uh, I think the reality is that that's any of any such movements are <coughs> deeply suboptimal. I don't think there are any optimal currency areas anywhere in the world that we could think of. Europe definitely isn't. At best, Europe is is two: one north of the Alps and one south of the Alps. But it's not one. I would argue that East Africa is more of an optimal currency union than Europe is, but neither are particularly close. Um, I think answering your question is is going back to Bruce's question in a sense. It's it's a there's a kind of a functional, incremental, operational view of, of convergence that, that um, uh, clearly doesn't require full, full monetary union, but I'm certainly not over any, any reasonable horizon. Um, I'm not quite sure how I'm going to come back on the, the uh, Deputy Governor's point, other than um, what I wanted to do was to, to use these historic examples to, to highlight the fact that fundamentally we're talking about a political process um, not an economic process. One of the biggest mistakes I found in the early discussion of the uh, uh, East African Monetary Union discussions is this widespread belief that monetary union was about monetary policy. And monetary union is absolutely not about monetary policy. It's political and it's about fiscal. And a big part of saying all that I said was to try and make sure that we don't get seduced into thinking it's a piece of technical monetary engineering. It's with all due respect to central bankers, that's not what it's about. It's a, it's a fundamentally political question. I can't, I can't answer that question saying, do I think uh, that, that there's a sufficient political will to, to move uh, in the region? But maybe we could follow this up later. Let me, let me stop at that point. I know I've not done justice to everyone. Th th thank you very much. I don't have much to say. I think the only point I can highlight is that <coughs> when you look at the regional integration arrangements in our continent, they've been predominantly driven at the political level. And sometimes there's a disconnect even with the private sector to know what the pace where we are. But the, the example that you raised that in Europe, it was actually later driven by the private sector. Because when markets integrate, it's the private sector that have to drive production and benefits that can accrue. So there is also that need for that uh, link to be uh, strengthened and also move with uh, the, the private sector. I think that's what I can say. Thank you very much. I think it uh, remains for me to just say that and, and doing great injustice to the presentation and discussion, but to say I think the speaker started by affirming that uh, benefits expected from integration still stand, pro provided it's done uh, properly. So we are not questioning benefits that derive from integration, but integration is dynamic. It's never stationary either. Uh, it's subjected to centrifugal forces or centripetal uh, 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 forces. And in moving forward, first things first, there has to be a proper sequence. And there should be, <coughs> or shall we, I say, safeguards or safety measures must be uh, uh, devised. So institutional response to tensions, uh, diversions, uh, uh, Will be will be required. Uh, so things like structural uh, uh, instruments and structural funds, stabilization fa facilities would be needed. A lender of last resort role, uh, and the question of the high cost uh, involved and how they they would be uh, uh, shared. And that uh, design is very important. It's very crucial in, in, in setting up these institutions. <laughs> and making sure that they adhere to that de design. Uh, so monetary union is highly likely to succeed if embedded in an appropriate, uh, appropriate conducive fiscal and political uh, setting. In other words, maybe political and, and, and fiscal uh, uh, union. 
So deep integration can sustain but need to skillfully manage tensions and, and divergences. So tread carefully, maybe move forward, but tread carefully. <coughs> Uh, and I think Gibson uh, was a very constructive discussant, not adversarial. I think he added, uh, he elaborated on, on some of the points. Uh, so he added a lot of value to what uh, uh, Adam said. I don't know for the sake of time narrate, but I have some points on how I saw you adding uh, to, to, to the excellent work that Adam uh, ha has done. Uh, just to conclude by saying, even at the continental level, uh, like the, the, the timetable, because it sets up the years and so on. Act of when we move from OAU, which was liberation, to AU, which is economic, social, institution, African Central very little movement. Uh, central banks have been wrestling with the convergence criteria, the macro, in order to, to move there as first thing first. Uh, and it has been at snail stage, maybe even an old sea snail. Very, very slow. You can hardly see movement. Uh, you need special instruments to detect movement. Then Pan African Investment Bank. Uh, which also it was not how they would be related to African Development Bank and the uh, existing regional development banks, which are doing very well indeed in finance and development in Africa. Uh, that was to be based in Libya. Then there is African Monetary Fund, where the statutes have been approved, but nobody has signed yet, and ratification is still zero, but I think statutes were done three years ago. Then there was to be visual stock exchange, which is in the hands of uh, uh, the private sector. Uh, also, it, it has almost been do dormant movement on that, has been dormant. Let's thank the speaker very much, Adam, and the discussion, uh, Gibson. Please, let's give them a hand. <laughs> they were excellent, they were superb. And uh, you participants, look for yourselves. You came very <laughs> and ARC for bringing us together. Thank you so much. <laughs> so let's digest this. This was a very rich paper, rich discussions. Let's think and let's come to the author and the discussion <coughs> in corners during the tea break and, uh, and cocktail tomorrow and come back to ARC and give all those points and to the author so that they can polish. Thank you very much. Also, by the way, it's coming on ARC board as well. So that's great. <laughs> really, um, I, I think you'll also be uh, joining tomorrow's uh, private public policy roundtable. There will be a lot of discussions that will actually be conducted at this roundtable tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And there's one area that we didn't discuss today. This has to do with service markets, integrating African service markets. There will be a presentation of ARC network research. Uh, uh, tomorrow. Um, I guess with this, uh, we're going to end the day, and thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. Um, after tea break, we'll have dinner at uh, 7 o'clock. Uh, dinner will be at Marina Club. Marina Club is a walking distance for those who want to walk, but will provide transport at 6.45. So those who are free and want to take a walk, please, Marina is just next, next to the lake. Thank you very much. Uh, dress is uh, informal, not, not necessarily formal.